<coughs> well, thank you for coming to this uh, first lecture of this short course. <coughs> um, I'm sorry that no really adequate um, abstract or course description uh, appeared due to the rather hasty way things were set up. But the, the um, just to let you give you an idea of what I um, hope or intend, the, the, the goal is to give a, is to give a um, uh, fairly systematic and, uh, exposition, if possible, of what is known about the relation between um, geometric invariant theory and uh, Kähler geometry, to say um, notions of what's called stability, which we will discuss, and uh, questions about uh, the existence of Kähler-Einstein metrics, constant scalar curvature metrics, extremal metrics, and so forth. Um, so systematic. Right, so this is the goal. Uh, exposition of what is known about. So even, even though I've um, been kind enough to give you 10 lectures to, to devote to this, um, I think this, I, I'm, I'm sure we're not going to get through everything that's, that's known as, as much as we would like to in the end, but let's see how we get on. So to begin with, this first, uh, first section of the course will be basically elementary background on uh, invariant theory and moment maps. So this is um, a circle of ideas, well, some of them very old, some of them going back to about the early 1980s. So let's begin with a, begin with a sort of prototype case. Uh, let's consider the problem of uh, if we have four points on the Riemann sphere, complex projective line, and we want to um, classify these modulo the action of M Mobius transformations. I, the action of, we could take an SL2C, we could say, or, or, or PSL2C, we could say. <coughs> So we, um, we probably all know the answer to this, or the initial answer, at least if the points are distinct, then this quadruple is completely classified by the cross ratio. Which, um, different conventions we could take, let's make it this one. For, for, so initially, we're considering the zeta i distinct. So actually, there are, there, are, um, there are two variants of this question. We can, either, we can either take this set with an ordering, or we could just take it as a set of four elements. So we don't 
we have to we don't um, want to take out the labeling in in the um, if we want to do the second thing then we have to divide well, well known by the action of a finite group acting on these cross ratios and so the, the corresponding thing to take would be uh, some rational function so if we divide we want to divide by permutations then the appropriate thing to consider if I write it down right would be this formula but the the um, the, the issue that we want to uh, focus on is what happens if um, we want to allow the points to come together um, if um, if um, zeta 4 is equal to zeta 1 or zeta 2 is equal to zeta 3 then then uh, this thing this the, the natural definition will be zero if uh, let's see if zeta 4 is equal to zeta 3 or zeta 2 is equal to zeta 1 then the natural uh, definition will be infinity and if uh, zeta what else should we take 4 is equal to zeta 2 or the other one zeta 3 is equal to zeta 1 then the natural definition would give uh, one. So we can we can we can define the cross ratio in a sort of a, a natural way if uh, a pair of points come together, or because these because these closely give the complementary sets, if two pairs of points come together. We, 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 we don't mind if zeta 4 is equal to zeta 1 and zeta 2 is equal to zeta 3. We still know how we should define the cross ratio. <coughs> so defined if, if the multiplicity, the multiplicity of each point is counted is at most 2. But we couldn't define it, the cross ratio sensibly uh, in all cases. For example, if all four points came together, so we can't define if define sensibly if four points are equal. For example, if we take any zeta i not equal to infinity. And then we consider we, we replace them by t zeta i. Then the cross ratio of because these because multiplication di t is a Mobius transformation. Uh, this will be the same as this is this is this is independent of t. But as t tends to zero, up to the limit we get then we get zero 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 zero. So we can't preserving continuity and invariance. There's no way we can define uh, the cross ratio of the origin of multiplicity four. <coughs> so this um, theory we are referring to is, in a sense, a, a systematic way of understanding this and examples like it. This this prototype turns out to be uh, exactly what happens in a general situation. <clears throat> so from another point of view, when we were considering Another point of view. Uh, we could consider this problem in terms of the action of SL2C 
acts on well, either the symmetric power, yes, the d symmetric power of the standard representation. Uh, this is what would correspond to considering the points without ordering. If you take d points, the, the symmetric power, the d symmetric power of the sphere is um, the projective space of the uh, symmetric, the algebraic symmetric power of the of C2, just by taking the the, um, the roots of a polynomial. We think of this thing as a homogeneous polynomial. Uh, we, we let that correspond to its D roots. Uh, so we'll set the projectivization C2. Or if we, if we wanted to do the version with ordering, then we were considering the action on the tensor power of D copies of C2. So the ordering. And, 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 and the projectivization of this. So in any case, the, the, the problem we are we're discussing is to understand the the orbits of, of say, for example, of, of, of this group acting on this projective space. That's precisely classifying these uh, detuples up to, uh, up to uh, Mobius transformation. If you want to understand. And the, the, um, the, the general situation, which we'll consider for the first, well, l later on we'll consider something a bit more abstract, but in general, for the, for the time being, the al sort of algebraic situation, we want to consider a, um, it's called a reductive Lie group, that's to say, we have a compact group K and a complex group KC which is the complexification of, of K. So this is what's called a, by definition, that means this is what's called a reductive complex Lie group. <coughs> and we want to suppose we have a representation rho of Kc on some vector space V, complex vector space. So, so in such a way that K, we have a we, we have a Hermitian metric on V, and K acts um, acts by unitary transformations. So this is a Hermitian complex vector space. So that's just what we have here. This is a representation of SL2C. It has a standard metric with respect to which the compact group SU2, which would be K in this case, at some um, preserving the standard metric on this D symmetric power. <coughs> so this is th this is this is the setup we want to consider. So slightly, somewhat confusingly, possibly, we can always talk about two slightly different things. One is the action on the vector space, and the other is the action on the projected space. Um, so the, both, both things will be relevant. <coughs> so the, the, the general definition of what are the, the good orbits corresponding to... Um, our discussion in this case of uh, uh, cross ratio is um, very simple. So if we say an orbit, say 
AC times V. Let's see. Let's say V. V. That's that's. that's of course, it's, it's, it's called stable if it's if its orbit <coughs> is closed. Which is a very simple definition. Uh, uh, then there's another notion I want. So V is is semi-stable. if uh, naught does not lie in the closure of the orbit. So certainly, if it's stable, it's semi-stable, because this is just the orbit, and the, the orbit of zero is just zero. It says KC subset of V is close. I think it's okay. Oh. I think that's all right. Oh, I see. Okay. So let's. Um, why, why, why are these sensible? Right. Definition. What we want to do is to construct invariants of the situation, which can dis which. Um, we can use to classify the orbits, uh, and in fact, invariant polynomials. So the point of the, the first definition, the point of definition, definition one, just, just, just to give, give the rough idea, no details, is that if, 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 um, if, uh, if, let's say, O1 and O2 are two, Closed orbits in V, then um, by the Null Stellen sets, we can find polynomials, a polynomial which is 0 on O1 and 1 on O2, and vice versa. P1, so P is 0 on 1 on O2. And Q is equal to same as the corresponding thing. Two. Um, they're just any old polynomials. That's just about. It. So if these are, if these are, sorry, we want to say these are two disjoint closed orbits. These are different, distinct. They're, they're distinct. They're disjoint. Then we can use the device. This is where the, the fact that we have a reductive group comes in. We can, we can average P and Q over the action of um, K. We can take, the, we can take the, the average under the action of K. And um, then we will achieve invariant polynomials with the same property. Um, at least, at least that, when we take that average, we'll initially get a um, something which is obviously invariant under the compact group K, but for holomorphic functions, being invariant under K will imply invariance under KC. 
<coughs> so we, we average over k, we get invariant polynomials with these properties. In other words, we can distinguish closed orbits by invariant polynomials. Or if you like, the way of saying it would be that the ratio p over q is an invariant of orbits which takes different values on the two different... Um, <coughs> so, so p over q distinguishes the orbits. So that would just be like the cross ratio. If we take two distinct sets of um, two, two, we take two configurations of four distinct points which are not equivalent under the um, Mobius transformations, and the cross ratio takes different values. We can distinguish them by the cross ratio. So that's why these. If we just look at these stable points, then we have a good. We're in a good situation that we can we can construct invariant polynomials to distinguish them. Are they going to be only k invariant, or somehow magically k c? Well, that's if it's holomorphic. Then you think about it, k invariant implies k c invariant. That's a little, a little <laughs> lemma you have to to, to prove. <laughs> Whereas, I mean, conversely, supposing we have a, if we have a really bad orbit, it's not even semi-stable, so naught is in the closure of the, um, then any, um, any invariant polynomial, apart from the constants, will have to vanish on the whole orbit. It's got to vanish at zero, and to be continuous. The, um, the semi-stable ones are sort of not so bad. Uh, the problem there is that you can't, you can't, you can define invariant, you can define non-zero invariant polynomials, but you can't uh, necessarily distinguish between distinct semi-stable orbits. Just as in this case, uh, if we take zeta four equals zeta one and zeta two and zeta three distinct, we get cross ratio zero. We get the same thing if we take zeta four equals zeta one and zeta two is equal to zeta three. We get cross ratio zero, but those two configurations are not equivalent. So we have to, we, the, the cross ratio doesn't completely distinguish when we look at these semi stable objects, which are in this case would be the ones where we have a point of multiplicity equal to two. Q itself, twice. Well, this is a way of saying, uh, another way would be to talk about taking the, the, all the invariant polynomials, and that's a graded ring, and then taking the proj of that, and saying that this thing defines a, well, this is a kind of a more down to, just consider a meromorphic function, which is invariant, and takes on different values in the two, the two places, the two orbits. In any case, that's, that's uh, all I... I'm not an sure. expert on any of that. Um, but that's just to say why these are sensible definitions to make. Um, if, if you're... Uh, to say, what are the good points that we can essentially classify in a, in a sensible way? But on the other hand, um, while it's pretty clear this is the right sort of theoretical definition to take, it's not so obvious how you're going to understand that in any concrete situation, or what's, what it, how, whether it's going to be related to anything else. So there are, there are two basic facts which... Um, On the one hand, relate this to metric geometry, 
uh, and on the other hand, um, give a, a sort of a practical criterion for determining, in, in many cases, what are these stable and semi-stable points. And these these facts are uh, related. You can you can un- so the two facts. So the, let's say one is um, the Kempf Ness fact or result is that being stable is equivalent to saying that this is a good notation uh, we can find a point of minimum norm Like it, so say we, we, we've got this orbit, can we find a point which is closest to the origin? So, uh, the, 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 the other fact, that's another fact, is what's called so Hilbert Mumford, I call that. Is that uh, so? V is V is stable for the action of our group K C, if and only if it is stable for all algebraic one-parameter subgroups. A C star mapping inside. to say if and only if the orbit the orbit of this group is closed if and only if the orbit of all one parameter subgroups is, uh, uh, orbits are closed uh, similarly for semi-stable Be a positive and oh, uh, yeah, I'll come to that. Yeah, so that, that was this. That was just for this Hilbert Mumford part. Yes, yes. Um, that, that, that's true. Yes. Well, that, why don't we say that? But uh, it's semi-stable. V squared as positive. No, strictly positive. No. So half of all this is um, obvious. Um, if the orbit is closed, then certainly we can minimize the norm. Um, so that's an obvious part. Similarly, if, um, if, if the orbit is closed, if, if the KC orbit is closed, the fact that any C star orbit is closed. That's also pretty much immediate from the definitions. Uh, so it's the other direction which is the significant thing in each case. So, but both of these become pretty obvious um, for once one has a basic uh, crucial observation. So the, but let's, we're fixing on an orbit. So I, I slightly, perhaps in better call, my notation is moving around a bit. So let's, let's, let's consider an orbit um, of, of V naught. So we have this um, the function, which we, if we take a fixed V naught, move it around by the group Kc. 
uh, and then we get the, the, the length, and then we get a function, 1kc. <coughs> On the other hand, um, because k acts by unitary transformations, so this is the norm of, if I take any gk, v naught, if k is k. So we get naturally a function on the quotient space. kc over k in this, in this way. <coughs> I should say, in, in, in practice, um, we, we don't, well, we'll come back to this in a moment, but you, you, can, you can all, if you want to take k to be a unitary group, and say a special unitary group, for example, and this to be a special linear group, that's absolutely fine in practice. So, um, <coughs> um, but but it is a basic point is that these are these kind of homogeneous spaces, the quotient of a the complexification of a compact group by the compact group um, have um, well known um, general properties <coughs> that these are these are symmetric spaces. Uh, negative curvature. Weakly negative. In fact, in the Cartan theory, they're the symmetric space dual to the compact group K itself. But the basic example would be usually K is equal to SU2. KC is SL2C. Then in this, by a special isomorphism, we can think of Kc over K in this case is the hyperbolic three space. H3. So if you think of um, if you think think of the ball model of hyperbolic space, um, so this, the, 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 the sphere as the boundary, then Kc acts on the hyperbolic space, extending the action of Mobius transformations on the, the sphere. <coughs> In any case, we have a notion of. Um, of uh, geodesics in these spaces <coughs> that just correspond essentially to certain one parameter subgroups in Kc. And um, the basic fact is that this norm function that we get is convex. In fact, much more is true, much stronger fact. If we take the logarithm of this function, that's a convex function on this space. So let's call this say, H. <coughs> Basic fact. So let's take so log norm g v naught squared induces a convex function on h. So this search for the minimum that we're making is the search for the minimum of a convex function on a space of negative curvature. That would be the, the general setting that we could put our problem in. So in, in, in particular, well, um, up, to, up to reservation we'll come to a moment, the fact this is convex gives the uniqueness of the minimum. So we don't, um, the uniqueness of the minimum on Kc over K, that's to say the uniqueness of the minimizer on Kc modulo the action of K.
but la later, well, probably in, in the next lecture now, we'll, um, we'll do a slightly more general version of this setup. Um, with a, with a more general theorem. But the, the, for this version, the proof is um, very straightforward. The proof. Uh, so saying you have a convex function means it's convex along the, if you take the definition to be when you restrict to a geodesic, it's a convex function in the ordinary sense. It's, also, it's equivalent to say the Hessian is a positive definite. That's the definition. Um, so but by you can reduce to the case when they reduce to considering the um the geodesic corresponding to um, e to the let's say x of i psi t where psi is in the Lie algebra of k. That's to say we want to we want to look at this. Either the no, 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 not be not perhaps try to explain Too much, but the 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 the, the geodesics in this K C over K correspond to one parameter subgroups, which is sort of orthogonal to the in the Lie algebra of K C to the Lie algebra of K. Like this, we have to be rotate from from the Lie algebra of K, we multiply by I to get in sort of the orthogonal direction in the complexified. So rho will take rho maps um, uh, e to the, uh, so i xi to a Hermitian <coughs> element of the endomorphisms of V because we're precisely we're extending, we're extending by complexification. So it takes the Lie algebra of K to the skew emission things. We multiply by I, it takes it to the emission things. Um, so but we so we can we can assume we're working in a basis in which this is diagonal. So we can diagonal. So this um, quantity so let's say it's diagonal let's say it's diagonal with diagonal entries. I'll make it lambda i over two. Uh, this thing uh, we, we, yeah. Okay. Um, this thing will be the sum of just exponentials, e to the lambda i over 2, t times um, the components of, um, of uh, say, v, I'm just going to say a, i. We're taking the components of the vector v naught in terms of its basis, which we call those uh, ui. Um, we take the modulus squared. So it's just the sum of, so let's say, ai e to the lambda i t. So ai and positive. Now we put the lambda of 2. So all, all, we, all, all our lemma is, is that if we take, if we have positive numbers ai, any numbers lambda i, then log the sum of ai 
e to the lambda by t is convex. This is the claim. The AI is going to be the AI is going to be the modulus of UI squared. Or UI are just the components of our vector, making up notation. Uh, well, we sort of sometimes we're suppressing rho and sometimes we're not. So we could have perhaps we would best sort of put this sort of rho up there. And strictly, perhaps we should be distinguishing between the group homomorphism and the Lie algebra homomorphism. Notation is a bit. movable. So we can all, we can all um, do this, but we need, to, we need to differentiate this thing twice. So we can all do that, but it's not completely. Um, let's see, how does it, let's, um, let's do it. So we call this thing FT. This is um, one over times um, sum of a i down to i t sum of a i and the i squared equal to i t minus the sum of a i lambda i squared. That's what I got. So this is positive by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality applied to the um, the lambda i involves a function on a finite set with a, a measure given by these. If you think of these as the weights on a finite set, this is just the a weighted Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Is it clear what I mean? Right, this is, if, if I take this finite set with these positive numbers as the masses on each point, this is the this is the square of the L two norm of the vector lambda, lambda i. This is the L one norm. So this is just the usual inequality between the L one norm, the L two norm, and the mass of the the space. Um, and with equality, if and only if um, the the lambda is a constant vector, if all the lambdas are equal. Well, all, all lambda i appearing, so for which ai does not equal zero, are equal. This, this, this is the usual case of equality in the Cauchy Schwartz. But that precisely means that um, I mean, these, were, these things were just the components of our vector. That precisely means that this vector is independent of. So we take, the, we take the up to a factor. This vector is independent of t. So in the projective space, um, our one parameter, our one parameter subgroup fixes the point v naught up to a, up to a phase. So we get we get strict strict convexity. Unless the one parameter subgroup fixes the class of P naught in the projectivized space.
So now, let's for simplicity suppose that um, at the orbit in question, the action is um, free. So let's suppose. That G goes to um, G of V naught is injective. So that so that, then we have strict convexity. On the hand, to prove that um, to prove that the KC v naught is closed, this is equivalent to saying that the map from Kc that the um, the map from Kc into this v naught is a is, is a proper map which is the same as saying that this norm function is proper. Give this the big of this function log norm is proper on Kc over K. But you see, if you have a if we have a minimum, then on each geodesic, the thing is proper. We have a strictly convex function on R, which attains a minimum. And it's proper. It must go to infinity as we go to infinity at either end. And then, by a rather obvious argument, if we just consider the GD6 emanating from a point, um, if we take any value above the value of the function at that point, then from each GD6, at a certain point, the function increases past that value. As we sweep the GD6 around, then we get some region such that outside here, the function is bigger than that given value. So by, just by considering sweeping out the space in the obvious way by rotating a geodesic around, you prove that um, indeed you do have this property. Likewise, by the same by the same argument, um, let's see, supposing our supposing right. So supposing well, supposing our thing is not stable, so this is function is not proper. Therefore, there's a geodesic on which it's not proper. Um, this geodesic corresponds to a an analytic one parameter subgroup. Um, If we knew that actually we could take this to be an algebraic one-parameter subgroup, then we would we would get an algebraic one-parameter subgroup on which again the orbit was not closed, and um, as asserted in the Hilbert criterion. <coughs> so um, so we can <coughs> so for the Hilbert Bumfeld. Time to stop. So let me just say we, we, we need to reduce to, to algebraic subgroups. But, but actually, that's quite straightforward because once we have once you have any one parameter subgroup, analytic one parameter subgroup, that's contained inside a maximal torus, and. Um, if we consider the condition, if we, if we write down the condition that the um, 
that this um, orbit not be proper as a condition on one parameter subgroups in that maximal torus, you see it's given by certain integer inequalities, inequalities involving linear inequalities with integer coefficients. So the basic point is if there's any solution of those inequalities in real numbers, then it's an integer solution of those inequalities, which means that we can always uh, re reduce to these algebraic one parameter subgroups. So the semi stability seems to be it's, it's a bit harder. The, the, the analogous statement about convex functions would be that if you have a convex function which is um, bounded below on every geodesic, then it's bounded below. But I'm not sure that's true. If you think about a function like, if you think about a function with level sets, something like this. The function will say zero here, minus one here, minus two, minus three here. Then, if these are the level sets, then the convex function, the, the function is not bounded below, but on any geodesic, it um, would be bounded below. So I, 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 I doubt that that statement is actually true, but I've had. <coughs> But for the convex functions that arise from these norm functions, you can easily see that that, that doesn't happen. So you can, you, can you can prove the semi-stable case by the same kind of idea. Right, so that's a good place to stop. I haven't really given a, an indication of the proof of these basic facts, this kempf mess uh, assertion that you can characterize the closeness, the stability by finding a preferred point, minimizing the norm, and the, um, the Hilbert-Mumford um, criteria that you can test stability by testing on one parameter subgroups. The next section I'll carry on to give examples and um, then we'll start probably towards the end of the next lecture to move on to applications in differential geometry and some ideas. So the next lecture I think will start a bit later than 11.30 I think because I, rather than 11. But generally it's 11 on Monday and Friday. Yeah. 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 Yeah.